Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the class series this morning. Uh, we really appreciate your joining us for this uh, special mini MINI series on the fight against uh, fascism. What a an appropriate uh, what an uh, an appropriate topic. But before I turn the mic over to our presenter this morning, I'd like to bring your attention to a few upcoming activities. This class is a mini series, M-I-N-I. -I, so the next class will be uh, Tuesday night, uh, beginning at 7 p.m. Eastern, and then Thursday night, beginning again at 7 p.m. Eastern. And then the class will con conclude October 5th, Saturday, uh, starting at 11 a.m. Uh, Eastern. So we hope you'll be able to join us for all of the uh, other classes uh, in this series, Tuesday night, Thursday night, and concluding on Saturday um, morning. Um, also, tomorrow morning, Sunday, uh, September 29th, we will have the work, the uh, writers, Group Exchange is running a special uh, discussion with Chicano uh, writer David Trujillo, and uh, the topic will be uh, uh, his, uh, an, an, an exploration of his writing uh, uh, today. Uh, he is a longtime veteran uh, activist, trade unionist, and a uh, writer of poetry and plays. We hope you'll join us for those uh, upcoming activities. And the system is still populating, but I've said what I need to say. And uh, so I'll turn the mic over to you now. Okay, thanks. Um, so this, uh, welcome to this four session intensive on fighting fascism uh, with, uh, you know, some side detours to uh, dialectics and strategy development and how this all fits together uh, as different pieces of the puzzle. Uh, this first session today, I'll be doing much of the talking, but I will uh, stop for a couple of times during the presentation and for questions and discussion. Um, and at the end uh, of the presentation, I'll be asking for some volunteers to do some uh, reading and presentation for our upcoming sessions. Um, so uh, just to talk a little bit about why I'm uh, why I'm doing this this particular subject. Uh, the short answer is that uh, I've I did uh, a version of this in 2017 and one in I'm not sure if it was 20 19 or 2020, but so I've done this twice before. But for me, it really goes back to um, 1970. Uh, I went to a party school in New York. And when I came back, one of the conditions of my being sent to that school was that I would do educationals based on some of the classes for my club. And the first one I picked was Dimitrov's United Front Against Fascism. So in in that way, I've been uh, dealing, talking about this subject, researching it. Uh, that was that first club educational was uh, a one hour educational. And I think I did about eight hours of reading to prepare for it. Cause so it was, uh, as I will urge you in, in the future, as you might have a chance to do a webinar or lead a class or lead a discussion, it's just as educational for the person leading it is as for anybody else. And I've always found that to be true. Uh, so I'm a 55-year member of the party. I'm the state chair in Washington State. Um, I've chaired the last two the program committees that did the last two major revisions on our party program in 2005 and 2019. I was a nine-term union treasurer, uh, and I've, I have, in addition to ones on fascism, I've also done webinars on strategy development, Marxism and the environment, Marxist view of the state, a number of other subjects, which you can, most of which you can find on our website. So I'm going to, uh, Start right in.
Uh, so here are the, uh, so this is just a rough outline of what we'll be talking about at the different sessions. The first one, uh, a short review of the dialectical method, and then uh, talking about the basics of fascism. What's the essence of fascism? Second one on Tuesday night will be a little more about the history of fascism in various countries, uh, Germany, Italy, and Chile. Um, and we'll talk both about the historical lessons and also something about how fascist ideology is uh, not really deserving of the term ideology because it's a mishmash of a bunch of different crap. And if you look at fascism in different countries, it's different <laughs> amalgamations of crap. Uh, but it's, uh, you know, it's not a, a coherent uh, and consistent program, it's uh, something that tacks and weaves and changes. The third session, we'll talk more about United Front and Popular Front, some lessons from our own history, talk about splits in the ruling class and building broad-based unity. And the last session next Saturday will be fighting fascism, uh, strategy development, and looking at our own party program and uh, Joe Sim's uh, main report to the last convention, uh, talking about this moment now and talk a little bit about Project 2025. So that's a little outline of this four session webinar series. So this is a quick review of the of dialectics, uh, the dialectical method. Uh, and I'll talk about how this is connected to fascism in a bit. It it'll, takes a while to get around there, but I, I will get there. Um, it's important to understand that the dialectical method is not dialectical understanding itself, just like the scientific method is not scientific knowledge itself. It's the path to a more deep understanding of reality and a way to test our uh, theories and hypotheses and programs. Um, the scientific, like the scientific method, the dialectical method doesn't tell us what results we will find or what the specifics of each process for, but it gives us a, uh, a path to discover the specifics of each process and how change takes place and what are the markers of that change and the drivers of that change. So there's some general dialectical principles that processes are affected by their environment and in turn affect their environment. So it's a two-way street. It's not uh, free will or determination. It's a, a, a mishmash of them, if you will. Um, we also recognize, as the Buddhists do, that everything is always changing, no matter how it looks on the surface, and that the world is a complex web uh, in which everything is linked, everything is changing, and all these processes are impacting each other. Uh, we think that time, place, and circumstance matter. It depends on what the stage of growing, maturing, or dying uh, of the process we're dealing with, and that includes political processes. And one of the things that's different about Marxism and the dialectical method is that we recognize that while much change is linear or quantitative in a fairly straight line, there are also nonlinear aspects of change where qualitative leaps happen, where that straight line starts to zig and zag and take leaps, and that those are linked. Um, and dialectic, the dialectical method is to help us use the method to discover what those uh, patterns and um, patterns of change are within each process. So there's three dialectical patterns, these also called laws. Um, quantitative changes accumulate and lead to qualitative changes and vice versa. Second, that changes are driven by the contradictions within processes, also called the unity and struggle of opposites, and that there's no end to development and change. All qualitative leaps lead to new unity, but also to new struggle and new quantitative changes. So I'll talk briefly about each of these. One that 
of the transformation of quantity into quality, that in any process you will see constant smaller quantitative changes which slowly accumulate until a tipping point is reached when a qualitative change transforms the process into a new state and a change set of quantitative changes begin to accumulate. This is also known as the transformation of quantitative change into qualitative change. So an example might be uh, U.S. elections. European elections and other parliamentary uh, method, uh, governments uh, are different, but in the U.S. it's a winner-take-all. So it's easy to calculate when that qualitative change takes place, the slow accumulation of one vote at a time uh, leading up to winning 50% plus one or more, in which case a qualitative change takes place. Um, which is namely that elections have consequences and which side is victorious gets to uh, take the power into their hands and start trying to uh, push their agenda. Another example would be union campaigns also where cards are collected and people are convinced one at a time or a few at a time until you uh, get a, a critical mass enough to call for an election and that's that accumulation of quantitative changes one worker at a time and once a majority is reached that brings a new quality either a victorious union or a defeated one and in either case a new stage of struggle the second is that contradiction is uh, the unity and struggle of opposites and that unity and struggle take place in all processes whether it's visible or not it's taking place in me it's taking place in all of you it's taking place in our the u.s body politic it's taking place around the world it's taking place within things that uh, look solid like rocks and mountains and oceans and we find indeed that these things are also all changing all of the time. So Lenin talked about this as the essence of dialectics, studying contradiction, because that's the motive force of motion, uh, that the unity is the relative stability and order of, of a system, and the struggle is the instability, the chaos at the edges of orderly systems. And it's often where the change comes from, the result of these contradictions struggling with each other until one uh, is able to resolve that contradiction and move on to uh, uh, the, the, next, the next stage. So the unity is temporary and the struggle is constant. Um, and that quantitative changes are the result of that struggle of opposites. It's the measure of the slow accumulation of smaller changes. Um, so, and that within capitalist society, for example, capitalists and workers are a unity of opposites. They interact and struggle and are mutually dependent as long as capitalism exists. So the unity is temporary and transitory. The class struggle is absolute and constant. And this is true within every living thing between what is growing and what is dying and the changing balance affects that, whatever that process or thing is profoundly. Uh, for example, the cells within our bodies constantly die and are replaced by new cells and the balance of that and how it changes as we get older has profound impacts on our lives. And the third is continuous development, which is often confusingly known as the negation of the negation. But this basically means that there's no end to development of ch and change. There's no permanent resolution of all contradictions. There will never be an end to history. There will never be an end to struggle. Sometimes those patterns repeat. Uh, sometimes uh, as contradictions are resolved, you move to a higher level, uh, though not always. We've seen uh, reverses also. But every new synthesis contains its own contradictions, which drive change in new directions. So those are the three main laws of dialectics.
And so some continuous development examples of this process of continuous uh, change, which is that an oak tree or other trees also, but an oak tree produces many, many acorns, only a few of which grow into more trees, but that process continues ad infinitum. Uh, if the, the acorn grows into a tree, it produces a whole new crop of acorns for the next generation. Or look at the, the process of society over the millennia. Uh, this is a, uh, this is a, a oversimplification. As we're finding out more and more, we discover how much so-called prehistory, how complex it was. But in broad strokes, the development of society moves from primitive communism, the sharing of scarcity, replaced by slave society, replaced in turn by feudalism, replaced in turn by capitalism, which will be replaced in turn by socialism and communism. So another example might be, in spite of Hitler proclaiming the thousand year Reich, as he did, the extreme militarization of German society couldn't prevent change and eventual defeat for the fascists, no matter how much they declared it. It ended up lasting, I believe, about 11 or 12 years, um, not for a thousand years, because that is determined not by individual preference or just by megalomaniacs, but by the movement and processes of society as a whole. So what does all this dialectical stuff have to do with fascism? Uh, for one thing, there's many proposed explanations of fascism, that it's barbarism and violence in politics due to evil people. Uh, it's the revolt of the dispossessed and afraid of being dispossessed middle classes. In other words, it's the rule of the petty bourgeoisie, or it's the rule of the lumpen proletariat who tend to be the foot soldiers of fascism. Or it's the rule of those who are confused and stupid and evil. Or it's a break with normal bourgeois democracy or that it is the last option for the reactionary militarist sections of the capitalist class. So there's all these explanations looking at the same phenomena. Which of them are true? How can we define, define, decide which ones are true? How, they, how much of them are true? How they interact? Um, and we need a method to do that. So because all these explanations have some truth to them, fascists are barbaric, the mass base of fascist voters and activists is filled with the petty bourgeoisie and elements of the lumpen proletariat. Fascism is definitely a break with normal bourgeois democracy. And many of those charged with carrying out the brutality and barbarity of fascism are stupid and are evil. So those things all have truth to them. But those partial truths, I think, focus on one or another aspect of fascism and can't explain why fascism happens when it happens and can't explain whose interests fascism actually serves when its actual policies are implemented, not, not the things that they say in public to get votes, but the actual policies. So to work our way through these, we need a methodology. We need tools to help us discover the underlying causes of any phenomena, including fascism. So that's why I wanted to reintroduce or introduce this idea of dialectics, of looking at any process and finding what the internal contradictions are, how, what its history is and its connection to other processes and contradictions, what the tipping points of fascist victory or defeat are, and sort of the history, where it came from and where it leads to. Uh, so that's what the dialectical method gives us, a way to work through this complex reality in which we live and discover the underlying and fundamental processes. So I'm going to go over this method again in a little different way of looking at it. Um, this is a simplified eight-step version in Lenin's philosophical notebooks. You can find 
is 16 step process, but I thought that that would take too damn long and this is not mainly about them, about uh, getting that deep into dialectics. But the method proposes that to reach understanding, we need to break things into their component pieces, learn the contradictions within those component pieces that drive change, learn the qualitative and quantitative aspects of each piece and their history. And then once we've broken it apart and understand the pieces better, put them back together with a deeper understanding and then we begin to approach being able to understand the whole. So we figure out the history of the whole and where the what quantitative aspects lead to qualitative chip, tipping points figure out which aspects are crucial and necessary and which are less so. As I pointed out earlier, if you look at the fascist program in the United States, it's different from the fascist program in Denmark, in Hungary, in France, in Spain or Portugal, in Scandinavian countries. Each of those have their uh, uh, historic and cultural specifics. Uh, and they also have things that are common to all of those aspects of that, all those versions of fascism. So figuring out which are the national specific uh, realities and which are the underlying contradictions and motions that are driving the adoption of fascism coming to power. And once you've got it back together and figured out the whole, you look for the links to other processes in the history of those connections in a search for what is new and growing and what struggles are driving current change. So this is another way of taking any process and looking at these different looking at it from these different angles and different processes and looking for those tipping points and quantitative and qualitative change points. And another very frustrating thing about the dialectical method is that there's no end to it. It's we always have to refigure things out. And that's because everything is connected to everything else and everything is always changing. So there isn't a, a fight. We can't say, okay, this is capitalism. It's done developing. We can understand it as a whole when in fact it's in the process of changing as we speak and we'll always, any pro, whether it's capitalism or, um, um, the, the process of automotive engines, any process you look at will have uh, these patterns for us to look at. So we have to constantly be in a process of looking for contradictions, looking for where qualitative changes are gonna happen, looking for the history of things and how that can inform our understanding and look at where, where those contradictions are leading us to. We can also think of the dialectical method as asking a detailed series of questions to help us decide on tactics and strategy. Um, and I'll get come back to this in the in the fourth session where we'll talk a little bit about strategy development before we look at what the party's current strategy is. But when we ask a series of questions, it's just, just not asking a series of random questions. It's asking about the internal aspects, the external aspects, the history, what the general framework and balance of forces is, what stage of struggle are we in, what are the objective and subjective conditions, what's the form and the content, what are the essential and not essential aspects of any process, including fascism. So to understand fascism, we might start with a series of questions What's the history of this particular fascist movement and what is new or different about that movement now? Um, what's different about Trump's election program in 2016 and in 2024? What's different about the movement that supports him? What are the forces involved in uh, supporting his current uh, campaign? What is it about the fascist program that appeals to masses of people and what is in the direct interests of the top one-tenth of one percent. So you listen to Trump's speeches, he's saying, oh, we should stop 
uh, taxing Social Security. That sounds great. We should, there are several other things that we shouldn't tax tipping. Various things that he proposes that are geared to appealing to masses of people. Uh, that doesn't mean he's committed to implementing them at all. When you look at the actual implementation of Trump's program during his presidency, it was all about tax cuts for the super wealthy. Uh, so the that was in the direct interests of the top one tenth of one percent. It was not in the direct interests of the masses of people, including the millions of people who voted for him. We also have to look at the splits in the ruling class between those who were funding and promoting fascism and those who are rejecting it. Uh, we see that this with the Cheneys, uh, very extreme conservatives uh, who understand from their class perspective that uh, when fascism attacks the legitimacy of the system, they can lose. They base their business model on the legitimacy and stability of the system, and the fascists don't much care about that. They mo mostly care about gaining power any, any way they can. We need to look at the national specifics of the U.S. fascist movement and also what links it to international fascists. What do the fascists do to mold their appeal, to attempt to appeal to or, or neutralize different sections of the capitalist class? So I was going back to my 2017 presentation and I said this was the real meaning of a meeting that Trump had right at the start of his administration with uh, tech moguls, with Bill Gates and um, Mark Zuckerberg and Larry Eliathan and uh, some others. Uh, the meaning of that was he was trying to appeal to a section of the capitalist class that had not given him its full support. This was an attempt to neutralize or win over that section of the capitalist class. So we need, what are the splits and what drives those? And why does the fascist movement appeal to millions of voters who didn't previously support it? What has changed? So these are just a start at some of the questions we might ask to reach a thorough and deep understanding of fascism. But that's not all. We don't have to just look at fascism. We also have to look at how strong are the progressive and radical movements? How organized and united is the labor movement? Does the pro-democracy movement have majority support? How well organized is it? How strong is the unity between different progressive movements? What's the economic outlook and how will that impact the coming election? Are there unorganized forces who can be brought into the movement and the struggle? So these are, we're looking not at fascism as a discrete thing, but we're looking at it as a complex process in motion that's impacted and impacts its environment, the other processes that are going on, the organization, the working class, the building of unity between different progressive movements, uh, the economy in general, the economy of the world, people's expectations about the economy, all of these form that complex mass that uh, is the uh, context within which fascism is struggling to gain more power. In other words, only after careful consideration of these major factors, the balance of forces, the history, the stage of struggle, then we are at a position where we can make appropriate decisions on strategy and tactics. So there's another quick summary of the dialectical method, that the real world is our starting point, that's materialism. We look at processes in their connections and interactions in the real world. That's those dialectical principles. We identify the quantitative and qualitative aspects of the process, the driving forces, the tipping points, and the history. Those are those dialectical patterns. And something I haven't mentioned before, but working through multiple ways of looking at a process, which is, I called dialectical points of view, also called categories, form and content, essence and appearance, chance and necessity. Um, those, that, that's, I'll leave that for a more detailed look at dialectics. But the, this is how this uh, 
scientific methodology fits together as a whole. So um, I'll stop there and turn it back to Dee to see if there are questions or comments before we dive deep into the distressing and scary and important subject of the fascist danger. Okay, Mark, we're opening the floor for uh, your comments and, and questions. Uh, so we're looking for raised hands as of now. Mariana, your, your mic is open. Hi, this is Marnia. I was just wondering if this um, slideshow will be available after this program because I was taking notes and I can't write that fast. <laughs> uh, well, don't, normally I'd uh, wait to, to respond until I get a number of questions, but that's an easy one to answer. Uh, you can get it in two forms. One is Dee will be sending out after today's session the um, the recording of it, which will include my voice and uh, the slideshow presentation. Uh, towards the end, I'll also give you my email and you can uh, email me and get just the slideshow if you want that. Okay, we're looking for more raised hands and we don't see any other raised hands as of okay. yet. Okay, well, uh, there'll be, I will stop again in a bit, but no sense. Uh, having dead air. So I'll proceed to talk about the struggle against the fascist danger and what the um, uh, Marxist view of the essence of fascism. In essence, our answer to that question earlier of, you know, is it, uh, should we look at the great man theory or should we uh, look at pe the petty bourgeoisie or uh, is it just evil people or authoritarians or what? what is the essence of fascism? So here's a blast from the past, from 2020. This was uh, uh, AOC saying, voting for Joe Biden is not about whether you agree with him. It's a vote to let our democracy live another day. Uh, and we need to show up. And no one politician is the answer. No one president is the answer. Mass movements are the answer. So this was... Uh, very uh, true then, and it is true now in a different, a different way in talking about uh, the Harris campaign. So it's worth repeating, mass movements are the answer. It's not about one particular politician or another or one particular group of politicians. It's about what movements are allied, what movements are uniting, what movements have the power to affect change, and are they ready to use that power and understand that they have it? Because math is in motion constitute the only power strong enough to defeat fascism. The reality, whether we like it or not, is that the fascists and the military will always have more weapons. They will always have more firepower. Uh, they will always have a determination to be brutal in the use of power if that's what they think is needed. So the only real counter powerful enough to defeat that is math is in motion, millions of people. Now, we should understand that mass movements express themselves in many ways using many forms of struggle. Uh, and sometimes we're accused of just seeing it all as an electoral path. But in fact, mass movements engage in many forms of struggle, demonstrations and protests, mass marches, civil disobedience, petition campaigns, postcard campaigns, phone banking, voting and helping others vote, campaigning for progressive candidates, campaigning for anti-fascist candidates, could be strikes, could be general strikes, boycotts. These are all the, some of the many varied ways in which mass movements uh, engage in struggle. And uh, none of them, no one of them by itself is sufficient. It takes uh, all of these working together to build that uh, critical mass of millions of people in motion to defeat fascism. People often ask, they don't ask this as much anymore as they used to back when I was a kid. Uh, many decades ago, but people ask, you know, Hitler said what he was going to do in Mein Kampf. Why didn't people believe him? Uh, and 
in one way or another, Trump and those around him have been telling us and showing us what they want and what they plan to do and what they hope to get away with, uh, first and foremost with Project 2025. Uh, but they're, they're also already leading the basis to uh, cast doubts on the outcome of the election, which I think they fully expect to lose. Uh, you know, demonstrations outside uh, voting centers, uh, sending uh, so-called election monitors to different voting places to intimidate voters, try to intimidate people away from voting, uh, having a whole raft of lawsuits ready to go to cast doubt, to muck up the works, to delay, and to give them time to organize, uh, including organizing insurrections. Trump has repeatedly pledged that if back in power, he will not hesitate to send U.S. troops and or mercenaries into U.S. cities. He's excluded, excused murder by right-wing vigilantes. He's threatened extrajudicial killings of protesters. He's even uh, threatened extrajudicial killings of some of his former cabinet members. He's claimed that he is the retaliation and the rep retribution and that that's a valid reason for police and militia violence. And if you look at the rhetoric at Trump rallies, and there have been people they're comparing his speeches now to his speeches in 2020, uh, the rhetoric, the violence of the rhetoric and the violence of the attacks on others, any opponents, is escalating. More violence, more threats to shoot protesters in the streets, to shoot Democrats, elected Democrats, anyone they don't like in urban areas, threatening violence in the street if Trump loses the election. Uh, there's no reason to think they won't try this again and use uh, the failed coup attempt on January 6, 2021 as a template to learn how to do it better or look at Trump and Vance escalating their anti-communism, at attacking even moderate middle of the road Democrats as communist Marxist fascists and all kinds of things, uh, expletives without real meaning. It doesn't have to make sense. It just has to be something that resonates with their base. So these are all reasons Trump and Project 2025 are telling us exactly what they plan to do. Uh, and I think we should believe that they mean it. Uh, I've heard some people say, well, Trump didn't get to do everything he tried before, so he won't get to do everything now, so why panic? Or Project 2025 is just a long right-wing wish list, so don't panic. It's no different than what they've always wanted. Or Tim Wall saying, I know if they go to the trouble of writing out a playbook, they plan to use it. And many others, including many mainstream middle of the road Democrats and even some very conservative Republicans say Project 2025 is a blueprint for fascism. They're telling us what they want to do or what they would like to do or what they'll do if they can get away with it. It doesn't that doesn't mean it's a guarantee that every piece of their plan would immediately go into effect the minute Trump takes office. Uh, but their goal is to have this plan in place and to have plans in place to replace tens of thousands of federal government employees uh, so that they can implement as much as possible, so they can implement as much as they can get away with. And the only way to stop that is to start fighting against it now. Uh, so there are many common factors to all fascist regimes, and these are all themes of the Trump campaigns and administration. Militarism, extreme nationalism, rejection of substantive democracy, brutality in domestic as well, in, as, well as foreign policy, and a toxic stew of ideology that doesn't make sense. And this leads to the, me to the conclusion that there's only one fundamental principle for fascists, and that is power, gaining power, maintaining power, imposing power, refusing to let go of power, including 
uh, mass violence as a means of gaining, maintaining, imposing, and not letting go of power. Um, so you can see the, with with the, the Trump campaign and and the sort of wide variety of fascists who have come out from under the rocks over the last uh, eight ten years, uh, extreme nationalism, Christian nationalism, views that um, the Constitution is. Uh, biblically ordained, so uh, you have to you have to be a, a believer in a particular narrow brand of Christianity um, to understand and be able to enforce the Constitution according to their dictates. There's extreme nationalism, hatred for other people. It's the Haitians, it's the immigrants, it's the uh, Muslims, it's whoever uh, you can pick as a scapegoat uh, to attack that. It's a rejection of substantive democracy. So they try to chip away, even though our democracy is limited, it's too much for them. And they've been chip, working to chip away at it for a long time with the support of many mainstream Republicans and even some uh, conservative Democrats. <clears throat> Uh, it's brutality and domestic as well as in foreign policy, celebrating people like Kyle Rittenhouse, celebrating, you know, proposing laws in state legislatures that it's okay to use your car to run down demonstrators, uh, that it's okay to, you know, punch people and beat people up as a way to get them to shut up. Um, and lastly, that toxic stew of ideology. Anybody who listens to Trump's speeches, they're just about incoherent. It's not about making sense or being consistent or having a coherent worldview. It's about saying whatever he thinks it will take to get the support he needs. So all of the actions of fascism uh, can't be seen through taking them at face value. You have to understand what the relationship of those things is to that fundamental drive for power. Um, so there's an illusion, what I think is an illusion that what Trump and the Republicans have done is just a somewhat worse variation of typical capitalist rule. This is a view that uh, Capitalism is bad, all capitalists are bad, uh, all capitalist policies are bad, so we should just fight capitalism. Fascism isn't, is just a, a little bit meaner version. Uh, but looking at it more deeply, we can look at the reality, the difference between what Trump in his first administration wanted to accomplish and tried to accomplish and what he was prevented from doing. Or look at the plans in Project 2025 and see what they are planning to do. That they have engaged in many fascist actions and in the promotion of fascism. But being able to accomplish all those goals, full-fledged fascism, fascism in full control of state power would be worse. The military in the streets of major cities, opening concentration camps for millions of people, the summary execution of opponents, encouraging violence by right-wing militias, eliminating voting rights, eliminating congressional oversight, uh, making the president immune from prosecution for any and everything, uh, jailing political opponents. Uh, all, all of these are uh, would amount to a brutality. And this is not, it's not a matter of saying, well, what's going on now isn't brutal or what's going on now isn't terrible or what's going on now doesn't already con contain some of the seeds of fascism. Um, but uh, the, the reality of fascism would be uh, a significant break with the system of bourgeois democracy Fascism comes to power in, a, in an attack on that democracy, as we can see from uh, all of the actions to restrict voting, to restrict early voting, to get rid of early voting, to make it harder to register, to make you know more stringent requirements for voter ID and on and on, throwing millions of people off the rolls. All these are aimed at 
destroying even the uh, limited democracy that we have because it would be a fetter on the fascist program. It would give even a little bit of power to those who might organize to oppose the fascist program. And when once they get a grip on power, what do the fascists use it for? What do they actually accomplish? They make structural and legal changes to protect their grip on power. And you can see that in Supreme Court decisions. You can see that in all the attacks I've already mentioned on voting rights and other forms of democracy. They, uh, one of the great accomplishments of the Trump administration was the hundreds of justices who've, uh, judges who've been appointed who will be in uh, remaining making decisions that have impact our lives for many decades to come. So that's one, they take advantage of those aspects of the system to uh, put in place uh, people who, who will implement their program and they make structural changes, uh, not just to voting rights and democracy, but also structural changes such that they do away with the right of individual government departments to make their own rules and regulations. Uh, they give uh, the presidency a veto power over all regulations, all, all, all of those limitations on capitalist power that we've won over many decades of struggle. And they're going to make it harder and possible. They'll eliminate departments. They'll put their flunkies in charge of those departments so they can't function. And they'll concentrate power even more in the imperial presidency. They'll escalate the use of military fo force to impose conformity and make the costs of protesting higher. If going to a demonstration is on a um, a, a winter, summer January uh, is, uh, you know, ha has its own risks, but they're pretty minor. Uh, but they're trying to make it much more difficult if the cost of going to a demonstration is you can end up dead or in jail for the rest of your life. That makes people think very hard about going to even uh, minor protest actions. And they escalate their policies, which do benefit the top 1% and the top one-tenth of 1%. Tax cuts for the rich, cutting programs for the poor, uh, using the power of government to directly profit some sectors of the capitalist class, uh, mainly the military industrial complex and the fossil fuel industry. And they want to gut and privatize Social Security and Medicare and they work to destroy the right of free speech, to protest, to petition for redress of grievances, to peaceably assemble, and to be free from unwarranted government action. They want those, those limitations on their power to be eliminated. So even though we are not yet to full-blown fascism, now is the time to fight all steps against democracy, against the right to protest and organize, against programs that meet people's needs. We have to mount a defensive campaign to protect those things. And now is the time to building lasting unity among many progressive mass movements. Mass resistance combined with a fight to address people's needs is the only way to reverse the political direction of the US in any fundamental way. So that's, uh, let, let me just do this one Dimitrov quote and then we'll uh, take another break for questions and comments. Um, Dimitrov in the mid 1930s looked at the history leading up to a fascist takeover and points to the need to fight fascism before it reaches power, which is a historical materialist analysis. He said, before the establishment of a fascist dictatorship, bourgeois governments usually pass through a number of preliminary stages and adopt a number of reactionary measures which directly facilitate the accession to power of fascism. This is what we're saying, that 
we that the first Trump administration was one of those preliminary stages, and the continuing actions of uh, Republican majorities in many state legislatures is continuing to adopt measures that will facilitate the accession to power of fascism, uh, making it so or proposing that state legislatures can overrule the vote in their state, can appoint their own electors, or uh, they have to, here's extra hoops to jump through before you can announce that the votes are certified, sp spreading uh, confusion and chaos, which facilitates the accession to power of fascism. He also said, whoever does not fight the reactionary measures of the bourgeoisie and the growth of fascism at these preparatory stages is not in a position to prevent the victory, but on the contrary, facilitates that victory. So I, in this section and the one on Tuesday, I'll rely heavily on quotes from Dimitrov. Uh, sometimes it's in, instead of an OV at the end, it's OFF, but same guy. He was a Bulgarian communist who worked for the Communist International as a representative to the German Communist Party in the early 1930s. <clears throat> he was arrested and charged as the mastermind in the burning of the Reichstag, the uh, German legislature. The fire was actually set by fascists themselves as an excuse to justify their grabbing all levers of power. Happened about three weeks into after Hitler had been appointed chancellor. So they charged Dimitrov as uh, the perpetrator of this plot, the imagined communist plot to burn down the legislative building. Dimitrov used the trial to expose the Nazis, embarrassing Hermann Goering on the witness stand and eventually winning his acquittal in a fascist court after the trial and his conduct of it and a worldwide campaign to free him. He then went on to become the head of the Communist International and gave the main report to the Seventh Congress of the Communist International in 1935 from, uh, and gave the famous United Front speech from which many of these quotes and the quotes and the readings are taken. Um, and after World War II, he became the first head of socialist Bulgaria. Um, so let me let me actually go back and stop there and ask if there are questions or comments before we proceed to get a little bit more into the definition of what fascism is. Okay, the floor is open again for questions and comments. We'll take several questions and comments before we turn the floor back over to Mark. So we're looking for raised hands. Mushin, your mic is open on our end. Please open the mic. There you are. Thank you, Comrade Bodin, for the fantastic presentation. I'm a little confused about something. Is the fascism, is, is it because of a crisis in capitalism that they see that, that there is a threat that is going to fall apart? What is it they're afraid of? It's not quite, not quite sure. What is it they're trying to prevent? Uh, um, the general sense is that the United States has the it has developed the means of production to such an extent that it could, it could actually have a socialist society. It can be if, if the proper relations of production could be because they established. And the, 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 I think that the, some um, indication of increasing the militancy of the some of the unions is this what they're worried about? I'm not quite sure what is crisis they're afraid of. If you, if you address that. Thank you. Okay. okay, so Mushin asks, what is it that uh, what is it that the fasc fascists are afraid of? What is it that they are trying to prevent? Is it the unions? Let's look for uh, more if I if I understood correctly. What mm -hmm. is it? Uh, let's take more questions and comments before we turn the mic back over. Thank you, Mushin. All right, Kanya, we're opening the mic on our end. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, splendid, very, very good presentation. Um, uh, from your point of view of uh, dialectics and strategy, how can you characterize uh, January the 6th, I mean, the insurrection, the, uh, the debacle at the um, uh, uh, Senate and Congress? 
how do you characterize that on the path to fascism more or less as a preliminary stage mm-hmm. towards fascism how can you characterize that especially compared for example to the past uh fascism in uh, germany italy and other areas mm-hmm. thank you thank you okay, thank you we'll take a few more jacob your mic is open on our end there you are oh, um i just want to say first uh, thanks for the presentation um i'm definitely on board with the sort of the assessment of trump and the far right mega and stuff as, as fascist and the sort of quantitative differences between that and the the u.s left meaning the democrats and harris and stuff um i think just what i struggle with is understanding like whether there's actually a qualitative difference or if it's more just a matter of uh like on a spectrum sort of where the the mega right is a farther right part of the same spectrum um because a lot of the the rhetoric that i'm seeing um coming out of the party and stuff is is more about painting it as sort of a, a, a binary split between flawed bourgeois democracy on the one hand and fascism on the other but um i just struggle with uh whether there's a very clean clean line there especially when it comes to things like immigration and militarism imperialism uh stuff like that thank you thank you jacob okay carl your mic is open on our end there you are um not a question but uh mark asked for some input on how he's doing so far I think this is just a superb presentation. Um, it's it's uh, thorough and well balanced, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the presentation. That's all. Thank you. Okay, Cameron. Hi there. Um, I this may come up later in one of the other um, sessions, um, but in reading uh, Dimitrov's address, he references a lot. Uh, the social democratic parties in Europe and how to cooperate with them on building the united front and pressuring them into like sticking with the program of the united front um given that those parties had more of a working class character than like the democratic party in the united states while it certainly does have a uh social democratic element to it it's definitely the minority and subordinated element within the party um how should we address that and change our strategy whether that's just working with other mass movements or building up the trade union movement um but yeah just kind of curious about uh that dynamic uh in the united states thank you cameron let's see if there are any more yeah maybe one more and then i can respond to some of these okay uh i think it's stefan your mic is open on our end stefan anderson there you are. Speak Thank up. you so much, Mark. This is this is really really great. Um, I was just wondering if there have been any like mainstream media portrayals over the years of Dimitrov, whether during his trial or when he was jailed or his time in the international. Um, and separately, if there if you would recommend any historians to get a better grip on the time period that he lived through and his activities throughout that time period. Shall I go ahead or? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, okay. Well, I, I, I will attempt to address each of these a little bit, but again, these are, a lot of these questions are ones we're gonna be talking about through all four sessions. So yeah, fascism, uh, I mean, the, the way Dimitrov puts it is that uh, fascism comes to power uh, when the, the, the system is not working in the old way and uh, the revolutionary forces are not yet powerful enough to seize the initiative and uh, take power themselves. So there's a kind of a, a, uh, a crisis moment when sections of the capitalist class feel their rule is threatened, feel that continuing with standard bourgeois democracy will not protect them from the millions of organized workers. <clears throat> and hence, they have to strike while they still have a fascist option to impose 
through violence and military means and uh, uh, so-called legal means uh, to make the costs of struggle so high that people shy away from it. And it's because they're afraid. They look and they see that <clears throat> People are not responding to the system the way they used to. People are more, millions of people are drawing fundamental conclusions about the need for change. Some of them revolutionary, some of them just people looking at the situation and saying this in economic inequality can't continue at this level. So um, that's, uh, the fascists are afraid of that moment when millions of people come to those conclusions and come to the conclusions that they have the power in their hands to make fundamental transformation. And it's, it's uh, they, they look at this moment as, uh, as a sort of a last, last ditch moment. If they could get away with still just using standard bourgeois rule, they would try, they would do that. But they feel that the threats are growing. And before they get the left and the progressive movement and the revolutionary movement get too strong, it's time to drown it in blood before it gets any farther. We'll get to some more uh, uh, historical examples of that when we talk about Chile, for example, in one of the future sessions. Um, characterizing January 6th, there's several different ways. One, it was a, a first attempt to nationalize the fascist street brutality that had been growing for several years. There were roving bands of Proud Boys who went to Portland, Oregon. They went to uh, Chicago. They went to Charlottesville. They went to different places um, and engaged in comparatively small scale street violence. So it was an attempt to organize that street violence on a national level. Another way to look at it is, uh, somebody said, well, a failed coup is really just a rehearsal for a successful one. This was something that they, was a last dish effort that they tried along with uh, all of the other things that they tried to do to, to prevent uh, the transfer of power. Uh, and when the other things didn't work, this was their last ditch effort to try and do it. Uh, and they learned what was successful and what wasn't. And no doubt the next time will be better planned. I, that's no different than Project 2025. I don't think the, uh, the Trump campaign expected to win and they did not have pl full plans in place for what they were going to do once they had the levers of power in their hands. Uh, so there was a um, haphazard nature to some of the policies they tried to implement quickly. This time they're determined to get more done quickly and get more fundamental things done and get more massive things done. The plans to deport millions of people and to have holding camps, concentration camps for them, are beyond anything they tried in the first Trump administration. So uh, I look at the first Trump administration as a as a, a, a effort to see how much they could get away with uh, without making fundamental changes to government. Uh, they anyway, that's a longer subject. But now they've come to a good conclusion. They have to have their plans in place, and they have to have people lined up to fill all those slots in the government to implement their plans. Um, so, on the one hand, as a coup attempt, it left something to be desired, as a uh, you know, uh, in terms of size and scope and organization. On the other hand, it was an effort to put. Uh, the fascism street soldiers at the center of our politics. Uh, and they'd like to have, I have no compunction about doing the same again. Um, on whether fascism and a second Trump administration would be a qualitative difference uh, between uh, fascist policy and normal bourgeois policy. There's, uh, and I'm sorry to be indeterminate about that, but it's both. <laughs> uh, there isn't a clear line. Uh, for example, Liz Cheney, her voting record on issues that came before Congress when she was uh, 
the what the third ranking officer of the Republican caucus in the House. Uh, she voted with the Trump administration position 92% of the time. So looking at it from that perspective, there's no clear line between the policy of right-wingers in the Republican Party, extra right-wingers, extreme right-wingers in the Republican Party, MAGA right-wingers in the Republican Party. There's that That is a continuum in a sense. However, once fascism seizes hold, they, what they had in the Trump administration was a foothold on state power. And they're determined if they win again to do more, to grab more power, to grab more control, to be more audacious, to be quicker, to be harder. Uh, the things that they did tearing babies from their mothers at the border was humanitarily horrific. Their plans now are to put millions of people in concentration camps. That's a qualitative escalation. So it's not just a little more of the same. It's a, a qualitatively new level of using the power of government in a repressive, directly repressive and oppressive manner to as much as possible, drag the military back into U.S. internal affairs, having the military enforce, you know, when there's street demonstrations. Trump wanted to do that when the George Floyd demonstrations were happening, but there were enough checks in place that he didn't get away with it, and the reaction would have been more than they could handle. But they're determined to have that option on their table again. So it it is a it is an extreme of, uh, so you might say, mainstream right-wing ideology and policy, um, but it's also a qualitative shift. It's a qualitative break, and you can see that in Trump. One of his themes is he's always uh, critiquing what he calls the Republican establishment or the Republican elite because they weren't all ready to go along with his policies. Uh, so part of his program is an attack on the mainstream Republican Party and an attempt to take it over, which they've been largely successful at. Um, so <laughs> that's why it's hard. There isn't a clear line. But there is a qualitative shift with fascism and full state power. Uh, you can see that in the moments after the fascists took power in Chile, where they rounded up thousands of people and threw them in the uh, national stadium and started executing people summarily. Uh, you can see that in um, the, the fascist coup in uh, Greece in the mid 60s, so the fascist coup in Brazil in the mid 70s, both run by all uh, run by generals. Um, so that uh, that's another example of the the qualitative difference that they're ready to tear down some of the traditional checks and balances. Um, yes, so about uh, social Cameron's question, social democracy. Um, and yes, one, one of the differences between the United Front and Popular Front in most of the countries of Europe that's different from us is in part because we have a winner-take-all election system instead of a parliamentary one. Um, there's, um, we, we, we have organizations that are not really political parties in the sense that our party is a political party or in the sense that many European social democratic parties are parties. The Democratic Party is actually a compendium of a bunch of different interest groups. It's tens of millions of people who vote Democratic and see themselves as Democrats. It's the national bureaucracy of the Democratic National Committee and Senatorial Election Committee and Congressional Election Committee. There are uh, national elected Democrats and local elected Democrats who range from AOC and the squad all the way to Joe Manchin and everywhere in between. So I have a problem when people start talking about the Democratic Party as one cohesive whole because it's not. It's a bunch of all of these different things and we have to think about it in a more sophisticated way. Um, and 
there isn't a mass working class party uh, the way there is or has been in some European countries. Um, and so that makes winning a united front and a popular front more complex in some ways, because we have to talk about building alliances between many movements, not just formal political agreements between several political parties. Um, and we have to rely on an alliance, which is uh, an alliance in action, but not in, um, there, there's no formality to that alliance. There's no way in which our party, for example, and Liz Cheney are gonna agree on anything except protecting the right to vote. We do it because that's one tool among many to fight for workers' rights. She's doing it because that's the way to maintain the, the legitimacy of bourgeois rule. So we are proceeding in parallel, but it's not really an alliance in any sense. It's not any a coalition in any uh, organized sense. It's part of this broad movement of millions of people who want to fight to protect our democracy, sometimes for very different reasons. And that makes makes it complex in a uh, uh, in a, ways that are unique to the political system in the United States. Uh, I, uh, to, to Stefan, I don't have any uh, things to suggest about uh, mainstream portrayals of Dimitrov. I'm not aware that there have been any. Uh, but if you're looking for a fictionalized version of the struggle against fascism that I highly recommend, there's a book uh, that was published in the German Democratic Republic and then translated widely called Naked Among Wolves. And it's about the struggle within, inside Buchenwald concentration camp, which was the only concentration camp to liberate itself. And it's written, the author was a part of that underground movement in Buchenwald concentration camp, a very complex and difficult, almost impossible struggle. Uh, but it's a, a great novel and there have been, I believe two film versions of it. And I think you can find ways to stream them. Naked Among Wolves is the book. So that's not about Dimitrov specifically. He has a fascinating history uh, and I'm sure you could find biographies of him, but uh, I'm not aware of any uh, popular portrayals or uh, easily accessible in this country portrayals. Uh, and thanks, Carl, for the compliments. I appreciate that very much. It's you know hard to sit on this side of the screen and uh, I can't look at all of your faces all at once and get a sense of how you're feeling about it or what's giving you questions. So we rely on you to let me know. <laughs> So moving on from uh, Dimitrov, <clears throat> it can't, if we do not fight the preliminary stages and steps towards fascism now, we make it easier for them to acquire power and turn it against us. And it can and will get worse if we refuse to campaign and vote, if we hold ourselves apart from the struggles of tens of millions of workers who, truly or you know truthfully or not still expect democracy to work or hope it will work uh, we might not we might uh have a more uh jaundiced or nuanced view of uh capitalist power and capitalist bourgeois democracy but there are tens of millions of working class and progressive allies who still expect democracy to work or want it to work. And we shouldn't cut ourselves off from that just because uh, we think that the current uh, bits of democracy that we have aren't, uh, are insufficient, uh, but we still have to work alongside those tens of millions. If we don't plan to take to the streets in the event of a coup or a seizure of power. Uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll confess, I was, after the 2016 election, I was very depressed and wondering, and what brought me out of it was the Women's March, one of the single biggest demonstrations in U.S. history. And that struggle 
brought hope to me and I'm sure to millions of other people that there was a strong fight back and an organized fight back and a determination to get in the way. Felt the same thing when they tried to implement the Muslim ban and the spontaneous demonstrations at airports. Well, they were partly spontaneous, but they were partly based on an already organized immigrant rights movement. Um, so we have to get ready if they do the worst. We have to take advantage of splits in the ruling class. Uh, I've used Cheney, Liz Cheney, and even her father as, a, as an example, but Mike Pence is another example. A despicable, conservative, reactionary, uh, tends towards Christian nationalism kind of politician. Yet, we could be in a very different position today if he had gone along with Trump's program. So those were us. That was a split, not just within the ruling class, but within the Trump administration. We have to take advantage of those splits uh, because it mean it might mean the difference between us being able to continue the struggle and all of us being in prison or in camps or on the run for our lives. Uh, so, and as materialists. We have to recognize the objective reality that the only way Trump will be defeated in this election is by Harris. That's not a revisionist fantasy. That's a materialist analysis of the actual situation. We don't have to like it. We don't have to agree with Harris's program. We don't have to think she's the most wonderful person in the world. We just have to recognize that reality and uh, uh, adapt our tactics and strategy to that that reality doesn't mean we endorse harris it doesn't mean we send all our people into the streets to campaign for harris and only harris it means that we recognize that's the reality if the trump fascists are going to be beaten in this election it, it shouldn't be this way but it is the election of harris is the only way to do that <clears throat> And that's because voting matters. It's one field of struggle that we should not abandon to the capitalist class. And if voting doesn't matter, why do they work so hard to make it difficult through all the voter suppression tactics and laws and strategies? Um, why are they, you know, they passed a new law in Georgia uh, that means there's going to be hand counts of all votes, no machine counts, which will greatly delay the reporting of things. They're trying to muck up the works and give themselves time for uh, their legal challenges or their uh, action and violence in the streets to uh, create a chaos situation that they can benefit from. So they're already planning legal attacks on election results and, um, you know, make, making building more delays into the system, which gives them a chance to uh, uh, cause mischief, shall we say. They know that the legitimacy of the government rests on at least the pretense of democracy, and they badly want to claim that legitimacy long enough to implement their full-blown fascism. And this is one of the contradictions is that there's a contradiction between what fascists actually do when they have the power and what they say to the voting public when they're seeking votes. The, that program that they're spewing to voters and what they actually do are in contradiction with each other. If you want to uh, not tax Social Security benefits, not tax uh, tipped income, not tax uh, some other things and give additional uh, uh, tax breaks to the super wealthy, there, there really will not be the money to run the government. <laughs> you know, those things are in contract. You can't do all of it uh, without consequences and without costs. So the, the fascist answer is to promise people bullshit in public and when they get the power, implement their program, which benefits the top 1%. Uh, and but they you know their, their words are all oh we're the ones who are protecting democracy oh we're, the, we're they're the ones who are attacking democracy not us they're the ones who are weird not us that you know it's a, a, a lot of projection going on one of the things that our fight to prevent fascism is about is protecting the possibility of peaceful change 
our strategy doesn't rest on whether or not the Democrats will move to the left nor on whether their program and policies are good enough. Our immediate strategy goals are to save the constitutional rights to protest, to freely assemble, to petition for a free speech of redress of grievances, to maintain free speech rights, to be able to vote, to be able to register to vote, to be able to uh, manage to make it to a, a voting, a polling place, uh, and to create change ourselves. If they have control of power, they will make the costs of fighting for those things extremely high. Uh, so that need for political space to organize for change and expand democracy is not dependent on what the Democrats do or don't do. This has all been called a block and build strategy. Uh, what is the essence of fascism? Uh, we've talked about this a little before. Various historians and writers have also in various definitions and explanations that fascism is the revolt of the dispossessed middle classes. Uh, some version of the great man theory of history that it's all about Hitler and his personality, or Trump and his personality, or these uh, various charismatic leaders, or it's about the ro rule of barbarism in politics. All of those have portions of the truth, because fascism does base its mass appeal on the perceptions, prejudices, and perceived needs of, and supposed wrongs done to middle class and workers. It's also true that since fascism does end up with the dictatorship of an individual, the personality cult around that individual plays an outsized role. And it's also true that fascism is indeed barbarism and violence in politics, in both words and deeds. However, none of these explain how fascism is different from other right-wing trends, nor why it resorts to barbarism and politics, nor which sections of the capitalist class that fascism serves, nor why they pick a particular time to uh, escalate their attacks on democracy and, uh, you know, make a, uh, try to make a concerted effort to uh, gain more power. So again, going back to Dimitrov, who says fascism is not a form of state power standing above both classes. Fascism is the power of finance capital itself. Uh, you can see this most clearly in the Italian version of fascism, the, the, the first major one, uh, which called itself uh, a, a, the corporatist, corporatist state, that there was going to be a merging of the government and corporations to run the economy. Uh, in other words, bringing the power of finance capital directly into government itself. We see hints of this in our own politics with um, right-wing politicians inviting fossil fuel um, uh, um, experts or whatever into the room to write the rules for the fossil fuel industry. That kind of thing is is blurring the lines between uh, government and commerce. Uh, fascism takes that to an exponentially uh, different scale. Uh, for example, in Germany, by providing major industries, including the steel and automotive industries and the fossil fuel industries with slave labor. That was done by the, the, the government, actions of the government providing that benefit um, of uh, very cheap labor that could be driven as hard as you wanted. And the capitalists saw a lot of money real quick because of that. So this brings us to uh, our last half hour. And I want to go over the classic Marxist definition of fascism, which in my opinion uh, still holds true. It comes to us from Dimitrov's report to the Seventh Congress of the Communist International. It was developed in the course of actual political experience fighting fascism in several countries, not only in Germany, but in Italy, Spain, Austria, and Portugal, and 
Hungary and Bulgaria, and there were other countries where there were strong fascist movements, including in our country, the, the German Bund, and there were uh, the America First and the Father Coughlin um, a Catholic cult um, and some other uh, fascist movements uh, in our country. So we developed experience in those countries in the actual process of the struggle, not based on what we wanted or what we thought, but our real live live lived experience. And this definition is not based on what fascists say about themselves. It's not based on an examination of their electoral programs or public claims, but on what fascism actually does, the actual policies implemented by fascist parties when they're in power. So that definition is fascism is the open terrorist dictatorship of the most reactionary, most chauvinistic, and most imperialist elements of finance capital. So I'm gonna go over each of these terms. The open terrorist dictatorship, which means the abrogation of all legal democratic possibilities for protest and opposition. The, uh, and what happens is they shut down all avenues of uh, peaceful struggle and uh, peaceful organizing and make it so uh, all, all progressive movements and organizations have to go underground. Uh, they try and destroy them by executing them, executing people in the streets, executing people in the concentration camps, uh, changing the laws, making the judges uh, responsible uh, and accountable to the fascist government, not to the rule of law as it existed before the fascists took power. It involves the naked use of power, including military power and street violence for political ends. And that's the meaning behind Trump's uh, call often that if there's big demonstrations, they'll bring the US military onto US streets, which would break one of those longstanding uh, norms of bourgeois democratic politics in the US. So it's not just the ordinary succession of one normal bourgeois government by another, but the power of sections of finance capital itself, organizing terrorist repression and vengeance against the working class. So that's what we mean by the open terrorist dictatorship. They, uh, they don't hide behind legalisms so much anymore. They uh, get, uh, they pride themselves on the naked use of power and violence. So it's a government of the most reactionary, most chauvinistic, and most imperialist elements. Those sections of the capitalist class throw their support to the fascist movement at crucial points. <clears throat> they take advantage of fascist brutality to maintain their profits maintain their dominant position in the economy and maintain their political control. It's not the capitalist class as a whole which chooses fascism. Most capitalists, even big ones, prefer to rule using bourgeois democracy. So I'll give you a little historical example of this. Like Trump, Hitler's economic policy that he proclaimed when he was trying to get votes to get elected contain elements geared to appeal to the working class. He talked about giving the German pe power back to the German people. He also attacked all the old forms of bourgeois rule. <clears throat> he attacked um, Hindenburg, he attacked uh, the Social Democrats, he attacked the Christian Democrats, he attacked anyone who was uh, shy about being ready to use uh, brutal military means to suppress the growing movement. There was a specific meeting in early 1932. There was one set of elections in uh, Germany, and that was the high point of the fascist vote. The fascist vote was by and large the largest single vote for any party. But if you put the communist and socialist votes together, that was even more than 
uh, the fascist vote, but the fascist vote was the, the single biggest block. By that fall, there was another set of elections, and even though the fascists were still the largest party, their vote had started to fall, while the vote of the socialists and communists continued to grow. At that moment, when major capitalists were trying to decide how to maintain their grip on power in the face of this rising movement, rising organization, rising radicalization, looked at fascism and the fascists and said, we're going to pick them to keep us in power. Between that second vote and when Hitler was appointed chancellor, there was a meeting, a secret meeting that Hitler had with Cry uh, Thyssen and Krupp and some other important German industrialists where he went to assure them in person, privately, that uh, the bullshit he spread for uh, to try and win working class votes was not anything he intended. That was just the, the bait to get votes, whereas his actual policies would be directly to their benefit. And he wanted to reassure them of that. And he, in fact, wanted to neutralize them or take advantage of them as allies. And those industrialists and their political representatives were the ones who convinced Hindenburg to appoint uh, Hitler as chancellor. Uh, I'll go over this again in the next session a little bit in a little bit more detail of how that transition happened and some of the details of that political transfer. But that you know, people say, well, Hitler was elected, and that's not actually the case. He uh, he was appointed. So we'll go into that a little more next time. But this is a section of finance capital. It's not just random reactionary capital capitalists who are crucial to the achieving of power. It's the corrupt section who make their money through speculation, banks, hedge funds, stock gamblers, currency manipulators, and the corporations they control. So some of the big corporations, the biggest corporations in our country and in the world are in reality have a majority of stock is controlled by about three different banking groups and some hedge funds. Uh, so it's it's not just the financial capitalists, but the capitalists who they are allied with in fossil fuel corporations, the military industrial complex, and uh, some other um, most reactionary sections of the capitalist class. So it's not the class as a whole, and it's not just random bad actors. It's uh, those who are speculating and making money off speculation, uh, the, you know, the, the stock market gamblers. So it's not, fascism is not the unified reaction of the entire ruling class. Again, from Dimitrov, fascism usually comes to power in the course of a mutual and at times severe struggle against the old bourgeois parties or a definite section of those parties in the course of a struggle even within the fascist camp itself. Within the fascist camp itself, there were people who were fooled by the, the false populism that Hitler proclaimed. And once he was in power, he turned that military power against elements of the fascist camp itself. Uh, so that they would not be demanding that he implement those parts of the program that were just bullshit for mass consumption. Again, from Dimitrov, fascism impresses those masses by the vehemence of its attacks on the bourgeois governments and the irreconcilable attitude to the old bourgeois parties. So you can see that in Trump's, all of Trump's rhetoric against all the Republicans. Uh, you know, at one point they were all, um, most Republicans were united in honoring Ronald Reagan and his precept that thou shall not attack other Republicans. Well, Trump, tore up that uh, rule book and then set it on fire and uh, makes a point of uh, attacking uh, people who are the allies he's depending on to implement his program. He attacks Mitch McConnell. He attacks uh, various people in, in uh, the House of Representatives who aren't committed enough to his program um, and does so in uh, 
not quite not quite as bad as he attacks the left, but pretty sharply. So we we talked earlier. What are the, what is the crisis? What are the conditions that open the door to fascism? When the ruling class can no longer rule in the old way because the system has become legitim delegitimized due to war, civil war, economic crisis, political polarization, crises of legitimacy, and ignoring the needs of the vast majority. But the working class movement is not yet strong enough or united enough to take power, but is strong enough to be a credible threat to capitalist rule. Uh, well, here's another example we'll talk about more in the coming sessions. It's happened in, in Chile. The left had a foothold on state power with the election of Allende. They did not have full state power, but they had a foothold. And as the elections went on over the 1970 to 1973, the Popular Unity Coalition, their share of the vote kept growing. It wasn't a majority yet, but it kept growing from the upper 30s to the low 40s to the mid 40s. In other words, the door for sections of the capitalist class to choose fascism to put that movement down was shrinking. And also the door to fascism is opened when the fascist movement, the mass fascist movement is big enough and strong enough to uh, impact national politics and strong enough and big enough to create a political crisis which fascism purports to solve for the ruling class. So th these things fit with the five signature accomplishments of the former Trump administration. Tax cuts for the obscenely wealthy, the avoidance of oversight on stimulus funds by the Treasury Department, which handed out money with no conditions, uh, including loans that were guaranteed to be forgiven with no cost to the companies that were accepting those loans and stimulus funds. So those were direct financial benefits to sections of the ruling class or to the entire ruling class. But there was also there was the deluge of right-wing judges confirmed to lifetime, import, uh, lifetime appointments, including the stacking of the Supreme Court. There was the destruction of many regulations, uh, cutting funding for enforcement to like the EPA and many other departments of uh, cabinet departments. They cut funding for enforcement. So it didn't matter what the regulations were. There was no mechanism to enforce them. They cut programs for aid to the poor, attacked, uh, uh, attacked any programs that had a positive social benefit for millions. And they escalated their attacks on democracy, which I've already enumerated many times. Those are all examples of the steps that they were taking to make it possible for fascism to gain more power, to entrench itself more, to remove any legal or political limits on its use of power. So this means that we must not confuse the math voting block for fascism with the fascist political leaders. Their interests and what they will actually do are very different. And there are contradictions which can be taken advantage of. The key force for fascism is not the mass of fascist voters, no matter how rabid some of them are. It's the power of finance capital itself. And a united working class front as the center of a broad popular front coalition is the key to defeating fascism. So uh, next time I'll talk a little bit more about the, the semantic confusion of united front and popular front. They're often used interchangeably and that's fine, but we have a particular meaning uh, in uh, Dimitrov's speech to those two terms. So we'll talk about that a little next time. So this is recognizing that the fascist movement has many component parts, not all of them equal. There's Trump and his ego and his immediate family and his minions. There are the actual fascist stratus, strategists and policy makers. Steve Bannon, Steve Miller, Bill Barr, Chad Wolf, Betsy DeVos, Eric Prince, Roger Stone. 
to have the super rich who fund his campaign and fund the mass organizing aspects of the fascist movement, fascist movement, the Mercers, the Adelsons, Sheldon's now gone, but his wife is carrying on in his footsteps, the Koch empire. We also have the extreme right wing media, which is a, you know, a, a machine to promote outrage, uh, not just Fox News, but also OANN and right wing talk radio, the Sinclair network of TV stations, and many, many right wing social media outlets, which range from ones geared to the mass fascist voters and uh, pumping up the outrage and the uh, the sort of inside ball ones where the Proud Boys communicate with each other and set up uh, secret uh, garage nighttime meetings with the leader of the Oath Keepers to talk strategy. Um, so they have their own private social media to plan the violence. We have the Republicans in Congress and in the states, some of who are part of the movement, others who've traded their support, for example, of tax cuts for the rich in return for supporting the power of, of uh, the fascists in who are seeking more power uh, for the right-wing judges for tax cuts for not getting primaried from the right which is uh, another way in which trump has uh, used the MAGA forces to attack the standard support of uh, sections of the republican party he wants uh to know everybody on the Republican side to know that if you don't support him enough, you're going to get primaried from the right uh, and you'll lose the chance of uh, having your vote in Congress. So he wants to very much maintain that bludgeon, not against the left only or against the center or democracy only. It's also against Republicans who support his policy objectives but aren't as ready to use violence as he is. Uh, it goes through uh, many, not entire departments, but many police departments uh, are um, hotbeds of fascist organizing. And then there's the mass of Trump voters. And there's the fascist stormtroopers, the street soldiers, not to be confused with the mass of Trump voters who are uh, not most who are not in favor of street violence, no matter what they say in polls. Uh, but this, uh, the street soldiers, the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, the Three Percenters, there's a whole number of these, but they're all efforts to organize fascist militias not constrained by uh, the legal system. Uh, and here's, here's a list of some of those and some others. And they proclaim various elements of fascist ideology, the so-called great replacement theory, which regurgitates old anti-Semitic lies <laughs> about drinking the blood of babies, bringing people from other countries to swamp all, all the native born pure people, uh, claims that immigrant convoys are invading, predictions of race war, which some of these groups welcome and even try to instigate. Their, their goal is uh, a right-wing accelerationism. If we just start the battle, then the race war will happen, and then us white folks will come in on top. Uh, there's a Bronze Age mindset which advocates female submission and a glorification of the warrior culture. And there's new and, and mutating forms of Christian nationalism and Christian fundamentalism. But fascism doesn't have a fixed ideology. As Togliatti makes clear in his lectures on fascism, fascist parties did not operate from a fixed set of principles, but rather did considerably tacking and weaving to mollify restive sections of the population. Uh, their principle was power, gaining power, accruing power, maintaining power. And if they had to concede to um, small farm owners in one election to get a little bit to maintain their power, they do that. If they had to concede something to one group of workers uh, by giving a, a better contract to, to the railroad workers, for example, uh, they would do that if that was what was needed to maintain power. So uh, when you start talking about their actual ideas, uh, you find that 
uh, there's not no much, not much substance there and it doesn't make sense. Some of it is literally gibberish. It's a cobbled together stew of nationalism, racism, authoritarianism, militarism, and full populist appeals thrown in. And Dimitrov said, in our ranks, there was an impermissible, impermissible underestimation of the fascist danger. In part, it's because of that contradictions of between what fascists actually want to do and what they say for public consumption. It can take that underestimation in our country right now can take the form of saying there's no difference between the terrible things that are going on now and how bad it can get with full blown fascism. That doesn't mean that the things that are going on now, the support for genocide in Gaza, the uh, uh, some of the steps being taken uh, to to close the southern border, uh, those are terrible things that is going on and they are terrible things, but it can and will get much worse with full-blown fascism. It takes the form of saying, well, they're all capitalists, therefore uh, we need to be against all of them all the time uh, with no exceptions and that not vote for any Democrat or not take advantage of those splits in the ruling class because they're all part of the ruling class. So we shouldn't have anything to do with them. We should be pure rather than saying, uh, here's a split, this gives us this buys us time to organize and to build the revolutionary and progressive movements. So now, uh, uh, well, there's just, I hope, I hope we have a little more time for questions, but uh, I do want to ask for volunteers to take particular sections of a couple of books to read and prepare a short report for the class so you don't have to listen to me talking as much. These would be short sections to read from two or three pages to eight or nine pages and you would uh, prepare in essence a little book report on that section uh, to present to the class over the next three sessions in addition to what I'll prepare. So there's at least 12 possibilities. Some will be for Tuesday, others for Thursday or Saturday. Uh, also, for all students, if there are questions or specific issues or topics you'd like me to address, I'll try to include as many as I can. And here's my email address where you can answer, uh, uh, send your comments or questions. So let me give you a sense of what the uh, reading selections might be. Um, in Dimitrov, the United Front Against Fascism, there's part one, section one, fascism in the ruling class, a section on the united front of the working class against fascism, a section on the ideological struggle against fascism, and in the summary report of Dimitrov, if you have that in the version of the book that you hopefully have, uh, Dimitrov's response to the discussion First, the unity of the working class against fascism, and secondly, the United Proletarian Front and the Anti-Fascist People's Front. I'll come back to this screen in a minute. Uh, for the Thursday session, there's uh, a book, lesson, uh, Lectures on Fascism, given by Palmiro Togliati, a leader of the Italian party uh, at the Lenin School in Moscow. And so these are a little bit longer, they're chapters or lectures. Uh, and I'd like uh, people who would tackle the first one, the basic features, lecture two, the bourgeoisie's new type of party, and lecture eight, fascism's policy in the countryside. Uh, the one on the one on the countryside is especially, uh, it focuses on the way in which fascism uh, adjusted its policy to try and win or neutralize sections of uh, the rural population. And lastly, the appendix in that book. And for the Saturday session, uh, some sections from the main report to our last convention and a couple of sections from the main, from the party program. So for Tuesday's session, these are the, the ones up and if, uh, if people would volunteer, if you know, if we get uh, 20 people who volunteer for these uh, five or six uh, selections, we'll have to pick uh, 
and let you know by email, but I'd very much appreciate your help with giving these classes. So uh, volunteers for any of these sections, uh, please let us know. Uh, Mark, can you put your uh, email address back on the screen? Yes. Okay, so you see at the bottom of the uh, this slide, you see Mark's email address on the slide. And so if you want to volunteer, what what's going to have to happen, Mark, because we <laughs> have minutes. Yeah. Uh, uh, if you want to volunteer to help, then email Mark at uh, at the email address that appears on the bottom of uh, the slide here, uh, markbrodine1.mb at gmail.com. All right, so are you taking uh, questions and comments before we close out now? Uh, I'd be glad to. We only have a few minutes, so I'll have to address them at another time, but I'd be glad to take questions. Okay, so if you have any questions or you have any comments, follow the same procedure, raise your hand, click the picture of your hand, we'll open your mic. Cesar, we're opening your mic. Yes, hello. I want to first thank you for um, this lesson, these classes, they're very informative, they're very clear. I did have a question about the focus on finance capital. I want to learn more about why that is and how that, and like apply that analysis to today. Uh, thank you. Thank you. All right, Devin, we're opening your mic. Hi there. Um, so I'm from the uh, Southeast Texas branch, and uh, so I've kind of started my own little um, my own little project on the side. And I think the uh, not only with the write up for this um, presentation, you know, via email. I'm already working on an email for that now, by the way, Mark. So um, just kind of to get a little more. Uh, in contact with it, I guess you'd say. But um, I'd be happy to do any um, side projects or any other help that you would need with this. I'd be very interested in finding you know, something to participate in lately. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, just always looking for new, uh, new ways to participate in the uh, party activities themselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, not only that, try to cross it over with some effort that I'm putting in on my own to kind of put out my own sort of uh, media influence, you know, with information that I've been receiving from various party organizations and, you know, education groups and stuff like this. So, so yeah. So please, please, please email me and we'll, we'll set you up with one of those sections. Yeah, um, I'm working on, I'm working on a rough draft for the email and I also like to kind of some things in there so um we'll be certainly doing that so we can talk later thanks okay, thank you Devin. okay dimitri uh mark i want to thank you very much for an absolutely outstanding presentation i just a thousand questions as to the previous three presentations and the next hundred presentations <laughs> But I want to leave you with just one tiny bit of constructive criticism because you an old comrade and me an old comrade, we know this. At the end of the presentation, especially one so heavy, so depressing, so my God, if the whole world doesn't work, could you leave us with a few positive words of the I don't know, the soul of resistance, how humanity will stand up. And even if Trump gets in, we do as the people have the power to fight. Can you give us that excitement as a comrade? <laughs> I, I will this? never to do so. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Looking for more raised hands. Okay, Marina. Hi, um, I was just wondering, it's more of a technical question. I'd like to volunteer as well, but if I do, are you able to send us a PDF of what, whatever thing you assign to us? Uh, well, I can, I can at, at the very least send you uh, links to the, I mean, there's the Marxist Internet Archive has 
Dimitrov stuff on it, and I have that link. Um, and I'll look for a link for the Togliati stuff. Um, and the, our party stuff is on our website, but I, I can have the links for those, yes. Also, you can purchase the books. We need to support international publishers. You can purchase the books uh, at international publishers uh, on uh, online. Um, Alexand Alexandra, your mic is open. There you are. Uh, so you talked uh, a number of times about the difference between um, the the types of things that fascist uh, uh, parties like will will say in order to get people on board and how those are different from necessarily the policies that they put in place. And I, I'm very interested in in that because um, there are some there are some things that that fascist organizations will say that can get the kind of people who who really agree with us. <laughs> um, I've been following um, uh, the rise of um, AFD and some of the things that they say really like the, that they say they stand for I really agree with well as other things that they say they stand for like anti-immigration and racist things it's like okay well that's the real stuff that's that's the fascist stuff but they throw in all these things where it's like oh I agree with that and then I have to be like whoa this is a super fascist organization they don't mean that they mean something else um and i think it's really important to try and like figure out those things and cut through those things and how we can reach the people who may not be as well versed in the tactics that these fascists use in order to get support alexandra can you say what afd is uh alternative for deutschland uh oh. it's a fascist group in germany yeah sandy your mic is open um I saw you at the before we ended the last time. Go on, Sandy. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, thanks, Mark, especially for the dialectical introduction. I think that really strengthens everything. Just a question um, is, uh, how do we relate to the peace and solidarity movements uh, and dealing with Zionism as a, as a fascist threat in Massachusetts? Um, a uh, Zionist who happened to be a non-Jew critically uh, shot and, and critically wounded, uh, 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 an anti-fascist uh, assailant um, who happened to be Jewish. Um, so uh, how do we deal? Uh, our movement is so far sharply focused on the Biden-Harris Blinken administration and the $20 billion going to maintain the genocide ad infinitum. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, you were going to close. I was just going. I was just going to say that uh, four o'clock Pacific, seven p.m. Eastern time, and if you're in the middle, somewhere in the middle there on Tuesday, and we'll uh, be talking mostly about uh, the, some of the lessons we can learn from the history of fascism in uh, Germany, Italy, and Chile, and uh, what 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 the lessons for us today are, and how those the history of those movements uh, relates to the the, uh, the framework that I put out, the, the definition of fascism and looking at things in a dialectical fashion. So thanks everybody for your time and uh, look forward to continuing. If you're able, please feel encouraged to join us tomorrow morning. We'll be uh, having a conversation with uh, David Trujillo, a veteran uh, trade unionist, activist and uh, writer and we'll be discussing Chicano uh, literature and hearing him read his work uh, tomorrow morning. So please feel encouraged to join us. Uh, uh, and thank you, Mark, for the uh, presentation today. And we look forward to being on uh, classes uh, uh, Tuesday night, Thursday night, and Saturday, uh, October 5th. So good day, everyone. Thank you for joining. Look forward to your participation going forward. Good day.